Adam watched as a small sedan-like vehicle drifted around the corner of the narrow road and then proceeded to slam into the guardhouse in front of the manse. Obnoxious dance music blared from the front of the vehicle as Popper exited, clearly acting wasted. Who the fuck put a wall here? She yelled at no one in particular, before girls began to converge from around the lawns and walls, clearly seeking to investigate the loud disturbance. You can't mind if I park here? She continued, loud enough for Adam and Slip to hear from their position on the rooftop some 50 metres away. She then reached into a pocket on her chevante equivalent of a hoodie, pulled something out, and pressed it with her thumb before tossing it subtly. The car then made a loud popping noise and burst into flames, eliciting panic amongst the guards as they attempted to investigate the belligerent drunk and quell the flames simultaneously. <laughs> I guess that's our cue, said Adam, glancing at Slip. Follow me, she replied, activating her jump kit and pushing across the rooftop. Together they maneuvered around to the side of the compound, bounding across the rooftops. In short order, they dropped on the roof, hopped the fence, and took cover in the gardens, assessing their situation. This is our target, said Slip, handing Adam her omnipad. On the screen sat a profile of a middle-aged Shulvanti woman, complete with chubby cheeks and graying hair. Adam was surprised to see a chubby Shulvanti, as all the women he'd met so far seemed incredibly in shape, even the few middle-aged ones he'd seen in passing. He chalked that up to military standards, though, and pushed it from his mind. Taking the pad, nodding, and handing it back to Slip, they pushed through the low shrubbery. The noise, and even the occasional flickering light pulsing through the yard, indicated to Adam that the guards would very much still be focused on the chaos at the front. He and Slip pushed low and fast through the yard, eventually making it to a side door. Upon reaching the entrance, Slip gently slapped her left leg, drawing her pistol with her right hand. Adam put two and two together, inferring this to mean, stack on me. Pulling his own pistol, he pushed his shoulder gently against the back of the woman in front of him. Briefly examining the large framed sidearm, he guessed that a small lever just above his thumb was the safety, and flicked it downward. He put his left hand on her shoulder and squeezed gently, eliciting her holding up three fingers, dropping each one in rapid succession. Slip opened the door, pushing inside silently, Adam sticking to her like glue. The hallway in front of them was dimly lit, the denizens clearly having settled in for the night. Servants' quarters, she whispered over her shoulder before continuing ever inward. Adam alternated between following directly in his partner's footsteps and periodically walking backwards, ensuring that their rear was clear. As they neared the end of the hallway, Slip held up an open palm at Adam, both stopping before they entered what appeared to be a large living room in front of them. She pointed a finger at herself, gesturing to the left side, then to Adam, followed by the right. He palmed her shoulder twice, signaling that he understood he was ready. Repeating the same countdown from earlier, they burst through the archway into the room, Adam trained his pistol on the midpoint of the room, and swept it across as he rotated his lower body to strafe along the wall in his indicated direction. He was about to signal the clear for his side when he looked up, noticing two silhouettes on a balcony that rang along the edge of the two-story room. They were clearly watching for a window at the inferno outside, as the guards outside desperately tried to quell the flames. He turned to Slip, who had now cleared her side of the room. By this point, she was kneeling by the stairs opposite the couple in the room, and beckoned Adam over with one hand. The stairs were an overly grandiose number, spilling down from the second floor, made of some alien equivalent of marble, with wooden banisters decorated in golden filigree. He pushed up the stairs with her in tow. The solid stone made no noise underneath him as he slowly climbed, sweeping his weapon across the hallway that sat at the top. Satisfied that they were clear, he began to move around one side of the balcony, with Slip flanking the pair from the other. He slowed slightly as he approached, hyper aware of every small noise he made. Heel to toe, heel to toe, he thought, as he crept ever closer. He now stood slightly offset and behind from the larger of the two figures. Shooting a passing glance at Slip, he nodded. He lunged at the woman, sliding an arm around her neck and kicking out the back of her knee. The seven-foot-tall woman fell predictably backward, with Adam jetting her towards the railing. He put his gun to her head, whispering, Make a sound, and this goes very badly for you. You insolent woman! The woman harsh shouted with gritted teeth. Animal was burst out laughing when he realised they had not coded this simulation for male involvement. She was about to continue when Adam decided this wasn't his ball game, and pistol whipped her across the temple. The woman fell silent, still conscious, but clearly dazed from the strike. He paused to look at Slip, who was in the middle of pressing a small cylinder to the now-identified male's counterpart's neck. Looking at his own quarry, he realised it was in fact his target, the nameless noblewoman supposedly needing to be removed for seditious acts in this scenario. Hey, it's a VIP, he said nodding downward at the woman who was slowly regaining consciousness, looking more panicked as she did so. Slip tossed him an identical cylinder to the one she had used in the mail, 
who was now standing quietly, eyes glazed over. Nightfell, she clarified. We use it to make extractions easier. Things tend to go more smoothly if your target can't disobey orders. She finished with a wicked grin. He probably pulled the cap on the auto-injector with his teeth, but leaving it to function similarly to the endephrine injectors he had seen the medics use in another life, and slammed it home in the big woman's neck. She jerked at the sudden puncture, but soon her gaze communicated the same brainless expression as her male counterpart. Are you taking him too? he asked. I don't see why not. If he's her husband, then he could be a useful pressure point during an interrogation. She glanced at the woman and snapped her fingers, getting the noble's attention. Hey, you got a car? Where's your garage? Hmm, said the woman, taking significantly longer to process than she should have. Yeah, it's on the first floor, hallway behind the stairs. <laughs> when I say that, she said giggling, borderline slowing her speech. Following the instructions, the group pushed around the balcony and down the stairway, boldly dragging their quarry with them. As they ran to the bottom, intent on making it to their escape, the woman piped up again. Hey, you guys can't kidnap me. I'm a duchess. <laughs> Shit, thought Adam. Wish I had this back on Earth. We're not kidnapping you, Duchess. We're just taking you to a party, said Slip cheerfully, as she dragged the husband, clearly intent on using the suggested powers provided by the drug. Ooh, I love parties. They made it into a perfectly manicured garage, a very sleek-looking alien car resting inside. There was a garage door to the fore and after the car, indicating a back way out that wouldn't take them through the hectic scene in front of the building. Adam stuffed the woman into the back seat with him, and Slip put her quarry into the front passenger side. She entered the driver's seat and pushed a button on the console in front of her, the car rumbling slightly as it started life. Hey, says Slip to the Mal, where's the partition opener? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's here, said the Mal in a light-hearted, if clearly dead to the world tone. The door in front of the vehicle slid open, parting in the middle, as Slip drove forward onto a long driveway. As they pulled through the decidedly empty lawns on the almost 10-acre property in the middle of a sprawling megacity, Adam pondered the kind of work it would take to buy something like this back on Earth. He had seen properties like this going for hundreds of millions of dollars in places like San Francisco before the war, and with a Shivanti preference to spread out instead of building vertically, probably made this compound even more expensive. He was snapped from his thoughts as they pulled up to a gatehouse on the roof of the property, manned by a single, very nervous-looking guardsman. Hey, we're old friends that came to pick you up and take you to a party, while your guards deal with the unpleasantness at the front gate. If your guard asks any further, just tell her to pound gravel. You're the Duchess, remember? Fair slip. Turning her head slight to look at the noble in question, Clee still drugged out of sanity. Oh yeah, said the Duchess with a girl. I am in charge. They pulled up to the guard. Slip rolling down her window. Adam held his pistol below eye level, but clearly just waiting for the right moment to put several rounds with the woman. She was all that stood between himself and a successful extraction, after all. Who are you and where are you taking the Duchess? Asked the guard incredulously. Oh, I'm Countess Andrielia Shalfiaro of Hell Shalfiaro, said Slip. Clearly hoping to bullshit her way through the encounter. My dear mother got a call from her old friend, the Duchess here, that some drunkard had crashed into her old friend's front gate and invited her over for a small party and drinks at her manse. She finished with a smile at the guard. Ah, uh, Duchess, is this true? Hmm? Oh, yes, party, drunkard, and all that. Just over the gate and pound gravel, guardswoman, replied the bleary noblewoman. The guard sat to attention, delivered a rapid salute and practically sprinted for the gatehouse, clearly intent on following the orders given with such a dismissive tone. Under normal circumstances, Adam imagined, annoying a noble to the point that they insulted you was more than likely grounds for termination from your job. Much to his relief, the gate slid open in front of them, and they passed into the crowded city streets. As they exited the threshold, everything in the world froze for a moment, before going black. He opened his eyes to the flashing green button on the slip pod in front of him. He waited, still wrapping his mind around the events that happened just before, when Grimm opened the pod. Rise and shine, she said, apparently borrowing another phrase from his native tongue. We've got to clear out. We already went over our allotted time slot. Pod 14 technically should be doing their thing now. Adam took off the headset and set it on a clip inside the pod wall before setting out. The other members of his team were already outside of their respective tubes. Papa, what the hell was that? Asked Adam jovially. Oh, that little number? She said after laughing. I just modified something we've used in the past to distract guards before. Added a little Compem 7 and Napalm for the shits of it, and then improvised from there. Well, it worked. I thought this was to familiarise me with how you guys normally operated, though. Well, said the captain, answering in Papa's head, we had a slight change of plans. I realised that we don't really have time to get you used to our operational style by tomorrow. I wanted to see how you'd react in a poorly planned operation, among other things. She shot a glance at Slip, eliciting a blue blush from the younger woman. 
We sometimes get fucked by command and have to carry out a mission with tits all intel and planning. I don't like it, but I need to know that you can adapt and think on your heels. Well, ma'am, he said, as they fired out the doorway. I like to think my actions over the past week have shown that to a T. They have, but a successful sim mission will go a long way in calming the brass. Some of the command staff were decidedly unhappy with my choice in a new recruit, but they can go lick a dry clam. I know you're competent, you know you're competent, but they can't seem to get it through their thick skulls. She excelled, a breath before continuing. The good news is that this, combined with your rescue of Ferry, along with your completion of selection, should assure them I hadn't fucked up too bad. Adam nodded as they passed through the hallway that led back to the entrance of the converted warehouse. Coming through the door, he noticed that he was seven sure Vanti, and one terrifying looking werewolf woman. They were all dressed in the same uniform as his team, the difference being limited to the patches on their arms. As they passed, he noticed them all shooting him glares, varying from suspicion to intrigue, and finally anger. Holy fucking tits, Grim, said a Shorvanti woman with a clipped accent. I know you like the weirdos, but seriously? A fucking human? Pausing, Grim turned to the woman in question, and seemed to be deciding on what to say. Colonel Tenrakia, it's been too long, she said, using what Adam now knew was her fake-friendly voice. Yes, I pulled him from that rock after he helped one of my commandos scap a small army of rebels. You'd be surprised how useful he's been so far, considering he's a male after all. Fucking bullshit politics, Adam had to remind himself. She doesn't actually mean it. 